Okay. Now we'll divide this talk, get it up, into two parts so that uh, uh, we'll have a little chance for a stretch um, after about two thirds the way through. And now we're going to talk about <clears throat> how to reduce early breastfeeding sensation, a sensible solution, or a hard sell. So let's, again, uh, I have nothing to disclose. And the outline is, we'll start with who is at risk for early cessation, the science on hand expression, and a proposed solution. So who is at risk? You can think of it in two categories. First of all, mothers at risk for not producing enough and babies at risk for not getting enough. So two main categories. And in those categories under mother, there are many, but the, you can think of uh, separation like with a cesarean birth many times that babies are separated, uh, breast surgery, attachment issues, which are uh, all too common, and many others. Babies risk factors are, again, two categories. The babies that have compromised reserves, remembering that babies live off of their re reserves in the first three days, not on the nutrition of uh, colostrum, and infants with increased demands for energy. So infants with compromised uh, energy and infants with increased demand for energy. <clears throat> and of the compromised reserves, those would be preterm babies without those fat stores, post-term babies who have already lived off of their fat stores, so they're born long and lean. Uh, and with increased babies with increased demands, infants of diabetic mothers, uh, that's why they're so prone to hypoglycemia and high bilirubin producers, such as those that have ABO incompatibility that are likely to get jaundiced without uh, higher levels of intake of uh, colostrum. So today we're going to talk, we're going to focus on two sort of more hallmark uh, um, groups, the C-section group and the late preterm group. So starting with C-section, why do healthy cesarean babies uh, um, lose more weight? And one important reason is that they have less breast milk intake over the first six days. Now, these are uh, slides from a study by Evans, and the circles are the mothers of vaginal births, and the squids are the mothers of uh, um, cesarean. And, you can see they did pre and post weights at every feed for six days. And the, the graph below is simply the, the, the exact volumes that they're looking at. So that's one study. Another study uh, done by Zhang recently, 2019, um, showed that C-section mothers had, not surprised, delayed first feeding outside of the first hour abbreviated shorter first feed, first feed when the volume is higher, the same feeding frequency, but shorter feeds, they would feed for shorter amounts of time, so that 20% of cesareans versus 40% of vaginal births regained their birth weight by day six, so slower weight gain. <clears throat> um, it, it, if you look nationwide, first hour feeds is rather uncommon, actually. 3.5% of cesareans versus 72% of vaginal births. So what does that mean? It means they have less intake of colostrum when it's most available early on in the first hour, which obviously means less stimulation of production when, you can, when that stimulation power is strongest. Uh, which means that delayed lactogenesis is much more likely in cesarean births. They have greater weight loss evidenced by six hours. And here's the third day number, 
a quarter, 25% of cesareans versus 10% of vaginal births develop excessive weight loss. So a huge number. <clears throat> Formula by discharge is twice as high of uh, lower breastfeeding rates at seven days, three days, six months. It, it made me realize that that little video you showed earlier uh, from WIC is just terrific. Especially, I liked the point about not pushing for us earlier uh, um, uh, delivery, especially a C-section delivery, unless there's medical uh, complications. So, the, and there's less milk transfer over the first six days. A lot of people think that this excessive weight loss is all due to maternal IV fluids that perhaps cause excessive um, interstitial fluid in the baby, which is still a bit unclear, but I think what's not clear is the fact that they don't take in as much milk. And so we know that from our weight loss, our nomograms on vaginal births and, and section births, uh, that we do see this discrepancy early on. Um, one thing that is important, however, is knowing that uh, putting babies to the breast right after birth in many studies, especially this study from India, uh, showed very positive results. Um, this is a military hospital in India. And just with this single intervention, intervention of putting babies right to the breast um, during the uh, operation, remember that breastfeeding is an operation for the baby as much as it is for the mother. This single intervention significantly improved the rate of exclusive breastfeeding so that you can see the rates of discharge at two weeks and at six weeks was uh, quite pronounced. Um, but this is an important study, and uh, um, this was a, a study done in the Middle East. It was an excellent study, and it took term unmedicated, no epidurals, normal spontaneous vaginal delivery babies, almost 300 of them, uh, um, and normal uh, term babies, all of them great APGAR scores born by cesarean delivery, a little over 100. And in both case, cases, they put the babies immediately on the mother's chest with no handling of the mother or the, soup, the, the uh, uh, nurses or whomever. And they gave them 60 minutes to simply crawl to the breast and not even feed, but just latch on. That was all. So there was no assistance for 60 minutes in these everything going great uh, uh, babies. And roughly 75% completed. But only 11% of the cesarean babies with everything except cesarean birth going for them. And 88% of the term births completed this breast call when placed skin to skin immediately, no stopping at the pediatrician's uh, table, immediately on the mother's chest. Their conclusion was that encouraging unassisted breast crawl in every dyad, especially in cesarean births, may unduly delay the infant's first feeding. Not to conclude that we don't want them. We don't want to give them the chance. I think it's absolutely reasonable to put a baby there. But there may be a little bit more we can do to encourage these babies to eat and to encourage this mother to produce. So <clears throat> I think that uh, um, unassisted uh, uh, chest breast crawl or ch skin to skin right after birth is a fantastic thing to do. But is there a little bit more we might be able to do to help? Many healthy infants placed skin to skin immediately after birth failed to complete the breast crawl and uh, consume a lot of colostrum. And the three biggest risk factors for that are surgical delivery, the cesarean obviously, drugs and induction seem to play a role. 31% of induced 
versus 57% of spontaneous vaginal births uh, um, were successful. So there's something about the, the right time when you actually, when your body normally goes into labor and not to, to push things too fast. And again, unless there's a medical reason. You know, I can remember the times I was pregnant and I was just thinking towards the last trimester, boy, I am ready to have a delivery. Let's get this done. I've got to go back to work and so on. So for every excuse, I was so game for anyone to tell me that we were just going to get this baby delivered. No, that's not. And the video that you have that suggests going all the way, my mother would say, this is in these last weeks is when the little eyelashes develop and the fingernails develop. And I thought, oh, okay, we need eyelashes and fingernails. We'll, we'll wait. And um, anyway, so um, just to know that surgical deliveries, drugs, and gestational age are the three risk factors that may impede the successful breast crawl. And again, this slide, I'm going to show it to you again, that the drop off in uh, um, late preterm babies is over a third. So we've talked about cesarean section. Now we're going to take a look at these late preterms um, who don't seem to be, um, they're helped by baby friendly rules, but it doesn't seem to be quite enough. And here's some references for you. And we, we do know that these late preterm babies and early term births are less likely to breastfeed in the first hour. So gestation plays a, a, a real um, risk factor in breast crawl. And what we need to know about these late preterm babies is that they're immature in multiple ways. Um, they uh, cannot be expected, even though they look like just little babies, little term babies, they're not. They're very immature babies. They have immature thermoregulation. That means they need more energy or they get cold more energy to go up to keep their temperature up. They have immature glucose generating pathways, those three metabolic pathways. They're not as good at uh, sourcing um, their own reserves. And so they're more prone to hypoglycemia. They have immature processing of bilirubin. So they're more likely to get too jaundiced. And of course they have immature breastfeeding skills. They are the poster child for the the baby who fool you i have been fooled so many times by these little great pretenders and this is a seven pound late preterm baby on your left here and what do you notice you notice that this baby is sort of an average size but look at the arms um, this is a baby who does not keep his hands up by the cheeks who doesn't have the same tone He's much more passive. And this is a baby, a lay pretermer, at two weeks. And I will tell you, this mother brought this baby in looking just like this within hours of this picture. Actually, it wasn't within hours of this picture. It was within a day of this picture because what she had done with this picture is she got lots of copies of it thinking that she had the sweetest, happiest little baby. And she sent this out as her Christmas card. And then she came to see me the day later and I admitted the baby to the hospital for excessive weight loss, dehydration and hyperbilirubinemia. And um, these are babies who are too good. And the bottom line is that these babies, uh, um, they become exhausted before they become full. So it's very um, hard to differentiate satiety from fatigue. And so that's what this very smart mother did is she just thought her baby was content. But content to starve is a phrase that is commonly used to describe uh, these babies. And Bilirubin encephalopathy, where the jaundice gets so high, it gets into the brain and hurts first hearing uh, um, capability, uh, your um, hearing impairment, um, is used to be, when I started, 
years and years ago, it was something we were most concerned about with very low birth weight babies, those less than two pounders. But now they get so much attention. Rarely is that a problem. Yeah. So let's take a look at this slide um, that really explains it a little bit more. If we look at late preterm babies on the lower left, that's what their brain looks like. And look at that compared to right beside it, the 40, 42 weaker, the term baby. They're just simply every organ system is immature. So we cannot expect them to behave like term babies. We can't expect them to phone in their order for an adequate milk production or to consume enough on their own without assistance. So they're passive, sleepy, content to starve babies with ineffective milk removal. And when you watch them, many times it looks pretty good. But if you look carefully, you might see shorter sucking bursts, long frequent pauses, the one you're kind of wiggling, wake up, wake up, rub their cheeks, love the chin. They keep falling asleep, unending feedings. You put them down and they're, they're still kind of not quite full or content. They don't have that milk dripping out of their mouth. Infrequent swallowing, infrequent swallowing. So you don't hear tons of swallowing with colostrum, but every third or fourth swallow you hear it, a suck, you see a swallow. Um, but not with these babies. They, they are commonly don't. So no amount of breastfeeding or skin to skin or unrestricted uh, um, breastfeeding, um, it seems to be adequate enough to reduce the chances of two things, insufficient production and suboptimal intake. When this baby fails to access sufficient colostrum to stimulate an adequate supply. That's baby friendly policies are fantastic, but we simply need to do more. And again, anorexia is easy to confuse with satiety. You know, <clears throat> if, if any of you have ever been on a diet where you thought, okay, I've got to lose weight, I've got to lose weight, you get to a certain point where you do have anorexia. It's not a pleasant feeling, but you don't feel as hungry. And that's what happens with this gradual reduction in intake is instead of crying, instead of being demanding, they're much more passive. <clears throat> now, uh, an, another of this, uh, um, uh, the protocol from the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine by Jeffrey Maisel and Valerie Flareman says that with the exception of infants with pathologic conditions, the single most important cause risk factor for too much jaundice <clears throat> is decreasing gestational age so that for each gestational age before week 40 weeks, the odds go up. So again, they're just are not as sophisticated enough to handle bilirubin. So, um, and Vinnie Bhutani, many of you are familiar with the Bhutani bilirubin curves, uh, did a nice study that basically showed that even babies with pathologic causes for uh, excessive jaundice, babies that have ABO incompatibility or babies that have bruising or cephalohematomas or whatever, if you give them high colostrum, you can modify, bring down that bilirubin. Maybe not as much as you want, but at least it reduces is it and it may keep them out of phototherapy uh, or God forbid an exchange. So um, these, these uh, Maisel and Maisel is probably one of the most renowned people in the bilirubin world calls this suboptimal optimal intake jaundice, not getting enough. And the first and best supplement to prevent hyperbilirubinemia is hand expressed spoon or cup feeding. Um, and in this way, breastfeeding is best supported. That is the conclusion of their uh, protocol. And again, it, that question about how do you explain this to people who are unfamiliar with this, the protocols are a great resource to go to. And they, they're lists of when you supplement, you know, what the recommendations are, and they're all referenced with terrific references. So 
make sure you visit the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine websites and look at the protocol because I think that'll support <coughs> you are trying to communicate with people who may have different ideas about policy. So the next question is, would hand expressed spoon or cup feeding colostrum uh, um, reduce excessive weight loss? So let's take a look at the, at the, at, uh, the data on that. One is a wonderful study by Giovanni Bertini, who is a neonatologist in Italy. When I saw this study, I called her. Her English was a little better than my Italian, which is non-existent. And um, I, I was just so impressed with this study. I had some questions. Um, she had uh, a nice sample, um, 1,760 natural childbirth babies with their first feeding, they would go to the breast right after birth. She had a very low threshold for advising hand express spoon feeding. She taught it to all of her mothers and said, you know, just whenever you want, for whatever reason, she didn't wait for weight to drop or for Billy Rubin to go up. She just said, you know, if, if you want to take a little longer nap, why don't you hand express and have your husband spoon feed or it, 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 any reason at all, she would have a very low threshold for hand express spoon feeding. The average weight loss was a little below 6%. And the, the time that they had the lowest weight loss was at 44 hours. Now let's compare that to the huge study that Valerie Flairman did that we now basically have, it is the base for that, those growth charts, those nomograms we saw of weight loss in the vaginal births and the C-section births. <clears throat> but just looking at the vaginal births alone to compare them, um, these mothers were rarely taught hand expression in spoon feeding. The, their average weight loss in contrast to less than 6% was 7%. And the instead of 44 hours, they didn't start picking up weight. They hit their bottom somewhere between 48 and 72 hours, so later. So the Italian baby started gaining weight sooner. But here is the kicker. 0% had 10% weight loss. And less than 4% had 9% weight loss. And remember our vaginal births in our country, 10% have 10% weight loss of vaginal births. So a marked difference. Now let's take a look at her growth curves. Here are the growth curves for the Italian babies. This little yellow sign is the 50th percentile. So I'm gonna show you plot over this growth curve what our vaginal births do. They drop off just like that. And what do our C-section babies do? Just as you would expect, they drop off much lower. So we can change bilirubin, we can change weight by hand expression and spoon feeding. So unrestricted breastfeeding, liberal spoon feeding, hand express colostrum to satiety, they don't need it, they won't take it, does four things. It stimulates production, it increases the baby's intake, it keeps the baby exclusively breastfed, especially if you start this early, and there's less pressure on optimal attachment. I can't tell you how many back-breaking hours I have spent over the beds of mothers trying to help them with attachment and thinking we have to get this right, we have to get this right. And it's great to get a mother helping a mother along, but to keep it, to keep the pressure on it so much is a little bit unnecessary. Uh, uh, if you just think of, okay, it'll, we'll eventually get there, but we have to keep production up. And it's most effective if you start early, do it frequently and have effective techniques. So why spoons? I mean, why not a syringe or why not finger feeding? And these are fine, these are fine. But personally, the reason I like spoons is that there's no risk, no cost, reusable, uh, readily available, convenient for both collection and delivery of small, not 
as we get a lot more milk, but small volumes of colostrum. And they, they don't, they're not medical. They're, it doesn't sort of look like a medical intervention, like a syringe. It requires minimal training of the parents or staff. It's safe, effective, it's actually studied. So in this study of late preterm babies, randomized to um, spoon then cup uh, feeding, compared them to bottle feeding. This is in a NICU situation. There was no difference in weight gain, uh, feeding times, <clears throat> length of hospital stay uh, in the spoon cup fed compared to the bottle fed babies. Uh, cup feeding was associated with a protective effect on any and exclusive breastfeeding and discharge three months and six months. So it seemed a protective <clears throat> Uh, intervention to use compared to bottle feeding as far as breastfeeding. So that's a, a, a nice study to, to know about. Um, let's now move to the science on hand expression. And um, let me um, go through uh, six little studies. The, actually not six, because the first number one and number two are the same study. It's Valerie Flareman's study that I thought was just beautifully done, a nice, robust number of, of uh, subjects. And what she did was she took babies in the first three days who had difficulty with attachment. And uh, um, the baby wasn't latching or wasn't latching well or was uncomfortable or whatever, any, any attachment issues, term babies. And um, uh, she randomized them, randomly controlled trial, uh, to either hand expression and spoon feeding um, or to um, supplement with bottles. And then she found that, no, it was pumping. That's, excuse me. So now what we're doing is we're comparing hand expression to electrical pumping. So of breast milk. So these are all babies who are exclusively breast milk fed in this study, but some mothers are hand expressing and spoon feeding and some mothers are pumping. The mother, by mother's report, they found that the hand expression was more comfortable than the electric pump. And it was also more psychologically comfortable than a pump. They felt more, um, well, I'm sure you understand. Psychologically, it was more comfortable using your hands rather than a machine. And, and we're only talking about the first three days. We're not talking about thereafter. The interesting thing in the study was also that breastfeeding rates, just with this one difference, was 25% higher at two months. In another study by Magel, there was higher fat and caloric content. In another study, there was the same or increased volume. Uh, if you look at all the studies, there's never decreased volume. There's the same or increased volume in the first three days with hands versus pump. And I'll tell you about our study number five of hand expression in the first three days uh, in conjunction with pumps in mothers who had very low birth weight babies. I'll tell you that in a second. But simply to add, that there was no more nipple inflammation and pain with pumping in this last study, uh, more distortion of the nipple, which makes sense if you don't have the suction component. So now another personal comment, remember that I'm very old. And but when I started all of this, I had these dedicated mothers and I didn't know very much about breastfeeding. And as far as pumps, they look like these bicycle horn things. They were just ridiculous. And so I taught from, the, oh, just what I had done when I went back to work after my first baby was born. I just started hand expressing because there, there was just nothing better. And so I taught all my mothers uh, um, very early on, either in the hospital or right the first visit, how to hand express. And so I was very comfortable using hands because I wanted, this was in the days when mothers were first starting to think of going back to work. I, I, and the reason I hand asked mothers to do this was simply 
because I didn't know much about it. We didn't have the results of the studies that I'm about to tell you about. But it was because I wanted mothers to be able to go back to work. I wanted mothers to, if you start introducing bottles of formula somewhere around four to six weeks, just once a day, no more, or once every three days, no less, you'll never have a problem of a baby who refuses to take a bottle. So I didn't want them to go through that hurdle unnecessarily. And I also wanted fathers to be more involved and flexible if mother, I want them to have a more flexible life. So, and if the electricity went off and they, you know, where there was an earthquake and they were separated, I just wanted them to know how to get the milk out of their breast. So that was the reason for me getting really into hand expressing many, many years ago. So now, we have these fancy breast pumps and I'm at Stanford and we're doing this uh, very expensive study on breast pumps. And I'm finding that even though uh, I had to take a few lessons from our lactation consultants on how to put the thing together, that they're not working as well as hand expression. So I go back to the IRB and rewrite everything so that we can incorporate hand expression in the study. And to cut to the quick, we found that mothers of very low birth weight babies, less than 30 pounds, 30 weeks, uh, that their milk production um, was influenced by three factors. How frequently they pumped in the first two weeks, frequency was not an issue thereafter once they established their production. The frequency of hand expression only in the first three days, so these are mothers who used pumps, but in the first three days, they were advised to also use their hands as frequently as they possibly could. And not only that, but the partners, because these mothers were frequently sick. And um, when I gave, went in to give them informed consent, their eyes were drooping and they were feeling sick to their stomach and they were on magnesium sulfate, you know, on awful drugs and feeling terrible. So many times with permission, their partner was the one who did the hand expression and they felt so happy to be able to do something uh, for both their wife and the baby. And um, so uh, uh, frequency of hand expression and hands-on pumping, those were, and I'll tell you what hands-on pumping is in a second, but those are the three things that influenced production in these mothers um, and the technique we used was the technique that we have in our videos of uh, press, compress, relax, and, and compress and kind of hold it a bit and then relax it, which is, this is all available on videos for you, which I'll, I'll get to. We found that by day 14, the influence of hand expression was really dramatic. And remember, they were only hand expressing in the first three days. But the mother who, mothers who used it more than five times a day at two weeks had 780 mLs average. And you can remember I was saying that 750 is a robust supply. So two weeks, we have these mothers right up there. Mothers who used hand expression two to five times a day in the first three days had less and even less if they used it less than two times a day. So frequent use of hand expression was very helpful in boosting supply. And then we used hands on pumping because we had to go back to the IRB to get this in. But when the mothers would come into my office for these um, uh, uh, pumping um, studies, and I won't go into the details of it, but I could feel that they had a lot of milk still in the periphery of their breasts. There was still firmness there. And when they began using their hands in conjunction with the pump, um, they, at only two weeks, that was when they would come into the office for these sessions, we found that uh, um, their production went up uh, in 93% of the mothers, their production went up and they kept in rigorous uh, diaries of it. So you could just see it shoot up after they would start using hands on pumping as opposed to just letting the suction of the pump be everything. And then, um, but how much did it go up? It went up by about 48% per 
pre-instruction towards the end of the study at eight weeks. So let me just show you some of the, at two weeks they started using hands-on pumping. If I'd known this, I would have started it just when lactogenesis happened, when their production increased. And in fact, there's another study that duplicated ours, and that's precisely what they did. Their mothers of uh, very low birth weight babies got even more milk, but I'll tell you about ours. Um, so, th th and they did not increase how long they pumped in a 24 hour period. The, the pumping, uh, they decreased the frequency of daily pumping by a tiny bit. Uh, they increased the duration by a tiny bit. But the nice thing is uh, that they um, increase the longest unpumped interval, meaning the time you get to sleep at night. Uh, so they really appreciated that. They got to sleep more at night and get more milk. Now, this is a nice study that was done by Pam Hill and her group in Chicago that shows in the, the green are term, mothers of term babies who did pre-post weights and looked at their intake over a six week period. The yellow are very low birth weight mothers who use the exact same kind of uh, fancy rental grade hospital pump is in our study. And you, I want you to notice two things. The obvious is that they didn't produce as much as the term mothers their uh, um, average by six weeks was <clears throat> a little over 500 mLs. Another important finding that you'll see in one study after another is that uh, pump-dependent mothers frequently, after about three weeks, their production starts sliding downhill. In our study, this is the composite of all of our mothers. They kept going up the whole time. And finally, the ones who use hand expression the most in the first three days, only difference, they always, they all, both of these, all these mothers had the same frequency of pumping, but increased frequency of hand expression in the first three days of the star mothers. And look at their production <clears throat> by eight weeks. It was not average of 900 plus, and if you think about it, a term exclusively six month old breastfed baby takes in an average of a liter, a thousand mLs a day. So this is a huge amount of milk. And it really killed that idea that if you deliver at 28 weeks, at 26 weeks, you can't produce enough milk. If you're managed well and you know what to do, the, and, and mothers hang their hat on how they feel that day by how much they produce. If, if someone helps you launch that rocket ship in the beginning, if you have the know-how to do that, it makes an enormous difference to the diet of your baby, to the horrible diseases your baby is at risk for, necrotizing enterocolitis or sepsis, and to the sense of satisfaction to the mother, and for the baby's ability later to transition to breastfeeding. So um, let me show you this video just to talk about hand expression and hands-on pumping just for a minute. So the breasts operate on a supply and demand system. In the first few days, effective removal of the small aliquots of available colostrum on a regular basis stimulates production. Many babies who are with their mothers need help and time before learning to effectively breastfeed. Hand expression and spoon feeding after each breastfeeding can provide more stimulation to the breasts and more milk for the baby than breastfeeding alone. Mothers who are separated from their babies need to begin pumping within hours of delivery. Some mothers find it difficult to remove colostrum with an electric pump. In the first three days, using both the pump and hand expression can increase later milk production. This mother is learning to hand express for her one day old son born at 28 weeks gestation. A one cc vial works well for both collection and transportation of the milk to the intensive care nursery. A new mother who can effectively express small volumes of colostrum into an appropriate sized container and watch it being given to her infant 
can better understand the important protective role only she can provide for her baby. So this is hands-on pumping. For some mothers who are separated from their babies, milk expression is more effective when they learn how to combine electric pumping with breast massage and hand expression. They begin by double pumping, that is, pumping both breasts at the same time. They learn how massage and compression of the breasts, including the periphery, improves emptying. A halter top to hold the breast shields or a sports bra cut to hold the shields is useful to free up both hands. Mothers feel for areas of breast firmness and they observe the sprays in the breast shield to guide them to know where and how long to apply pressure over the breasts. After the output slows down, mothers stop double pumping. Typically there is more milk to remove to complete the expression process, mothers then choose different combinations of breast massage and hand expression. Others prefer to single pump using both hands on one breast and alternating breasts. Here, two mothers explain how they complete the expression process immediately after double pumping. If you only relied on the machine and not your hands at all, how much milk do you think the machine alone would get out of your breast? Half. Half. Yeah, about I half. think half. Yeah. I started to 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 squeeze my uh, my bed because I was not comfortable with the machine, only the machine, because I feel something inside. Yes. I feel hot. Still full. Yeah, still mm -hmm. full. By emptying yourself so effectively. You've had this wonderful milk production up to uh, um, a liter a day. When the pump seemed to no longer be drawing out any milk, I would go to hand expression and I would find that I was able to get just as much using hand expression as I had already gotten with the pump. After spending 25 minutes using the breast pump, she, you can see, got this much from the left, this much from the right, and following this 25 minutes, turning the pump off, just using her hands, uh, she got even more from the left and the right breast. This is what has enabled this mother to keep her production up. <clears throat> so you can, those are, those two mothers, that little Italian mom and the mother who was hand expressing were both mothers uh, in the study who came to my office and said, we're producing much more milk than the non-study mothers. Uh, could you please um, make a video about this? And uh, they offered to be in it, as did other mothers in the study, because they were so impressed with their production. So we have them to thank. So the World Health Organization and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommend for all mothers, pump dependent or breastfeeding or preterm or term, uh, that they learn hand expression in the hospital before they go home. There are many scenarios that would make this efficacious and, and uh, very important. So what is the impact of delayed or ineffective first hour milk removal? As you can imagine, as you can remember, uh, on attachment, there may be some confused oral dynamics for milk production. Uh, subsequent production potential may be affected. For consumption or calories, the infant's intake <coughs> may go down and in infant's intake, excuse me, protection may be delayed. So the same question that we raised before might normalize in the use of hand techniques with breastfeeding from the first hour, reduce patients associated with mothers stopping early and offer a leg up to high risk dyads. So this was an interesting study done at Stanford by Dr. Susan Crow, who is a, a obstetrician. And she, um, it's interesting how some of us get into breastfeeding. 
uh, Susan um, flunked breastfeeding and she felt terrible about it. She was an obstetrician who had always supported breastfeeding, but for her own, she was not successful. And that started her on a pathway of trying to learn more and more about uh, 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 breastfeeding. She is now a member of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine and a tremendously supportive obstetrician. So in this study, she taught uh, of cesarean and vaginal mothers um, to a hand expression in the first hour. And not only did it improve exclusive breastfeeding rates at discharge, and it improved uh, discharge exclusivity of breast milk feedings. Um, even if there was no skin to skin care at breastfeeding within the first hour, uh, it, so it improved discharge exclusive breastfeeding rates. And this is what kind of surprised all of us. It resulted in significant improvement in latching and um, so decreased problems with mothers with latching. Now, why would hand expression improve latching? And maybe it has to do with, you know, we just don't know how. In our society, breastfeeding is sort of behind closed curtains. We're very private about breastfeeding. So usually the first time mothers get to see what breastfeeding looks like is when it's up close and personal and it's you. And then you, you know, you're 12 inches away from a nursing baby. So we don't see much of what it actually looks like. And when some, some mothers need permission to um, idea about how to use their hands to help with breastfeeding, because it doesn't automatically, you don't know how to do this. So it needs a little bit of instruction and sort of permission if you, uh, uh, <laughs> So the conclusion of her study was that hand expression within the first hour after delivery was associated with improved breastfeeding and exclusive breastfeeding rates. Uh, now, this was a very interesting um, time I spent. I, I get invited to wonderful places in the world to talk. One of them was in Belgium, in Bruges, and where, by the way, they make incredible chocolate. But more importantly, at this hospital, uh, um, this was the mother of late preterm twins who had a C-section delivery and I was invited in. And instead of putting the baby on the mother's chest, what they did is they draped one baby over one shoulder and when the next baby was born, they draped the baby over the other shoulder in the operating room. And it gave the mother very good visibility and she had no pressure on her abdomen. And many times the pressure on the abdomen is what makes them feel more uncomfortable and sick to their stomach uh, while the surgeon is trying to sew them up, all this pressure on the abdomen. So that this over the shoulder, skin to skin. And it, it gave the mother um, easier visibility so she could see her breast, she could free up her one hand and begin expressing milk, teasing the baby. This is her babies, but with their sense of smell, to begin using their mouth and latching on. So it was a useful technique and one that I wanted to share with you. Now there are unquantifiable benefits to mothers of preemies. And <clears throat> this mother, this she just sent me this <clears throat> a couple weeks ago after going on the website and she said, our son was born very early, 29 weeks, and didn't have time to take a lactation or breastfeeding class before he arrived. So hand expression was just a foreign concept to me. It helped to have uh, hand expression coaching from the nurses. Hand expressing right after delivery and beyond was also critical to my feeling um, that I could start being a mom right away. I remember having such pride as I walked down the hallway, carrying my little vial of colostrum from my room to my son's bed. I, I just think that it's a heartfelt uh, expression of how it can be. So let's now um, talk about a proposed solution, but before we do that, let's take a short break. Let's get to the exciting conclusion. So given that the morbidity 
stems from these two things, not mothers who don't make milk, babies who don't get enough. Uh, and that these are potential uh, preventable problems. And given that no amount of skin to skin and unrestricted breastfeeding reduces these problems when babies, any, not just low, late preterm babies, but when any baby fails to excess sufficient colostrum or stimulate an adequate supply, and given that the first hour uh, um, uh, latching does not guarantee effective milk removal. So given the numerous predictable and unpredictable risk factors for insufficient production and suboptimal intake, should first hour hand expression be considered a proactive way to protect breastfeeding the newborn and the mother? And let's look at you know, thinking of prevention, because that's, that's where we have the, the biggest uh, um, punch as far as really protecting, promoting breastfeeding would be if we could prevent this huge drop off early on. If we do two things, if first of all, we have a, we're, we're very nimble at prioritizing our goals to either ABC or CBA. I'll talk about that in a minute. And the second thing is to consider how we could join hands with our uh, um, family practice and OBGYN uh, colleagues and um, uh, educate our mothers a little bit and give them the tools to her own breastfeeding experience. And I hope I can offer a way that you can do this easily. <laughs> um, so first of all, as far as prioritizing goals, um, it, 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 ABC, as we said, works beautifully for the baby who gets an A plus from the first hour. But for at-risk dyads, can we safeguard um, production and intake uh, and avoid over-focusing on attachment if we just change it to think in terms of CBA, so we don't let that late preterm baby drop too much weight. Uh, and we don't let those mothers um, saying, oh, if I had only known, if I had done this, I wouldn't be struggling with production. And if we look at CBA, what does that mean? It means early liberal hand express spoon fed colostrum. It means first hour then frequent removal of, col of, of colostrum uh, for production. And A, skin to skin, gentle cue based attachment assistance, and I'll show you that in a bit, improves with time, contact, robust production, and less pressure on milk transfer at the breast during the feeding. So here is a very sweet mother who wanted a natural childbirth and got everything but that. Um, <clears throat> her first time mother who goes in with ruptured membranes and 36 hours later, she has a fever, she's oxygen dependent and her brother, her baby is showing signs of fetal distress and she has an emergency C-section delivery. She has no recall of ever holding the baby after birth. This was such a traumatic experience. The baby <clears throat> was then taken to the NICU because she had um, strider. She, the the uh, outlet was compressing on her trachea and she had a uh, 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 striderous breathing. So she was taken to the NICU for observation and a workup for sepsis. And we taught the mother um, uh, in the recovery room how to hand express. She expressed probably because she had gone through so much labor, uh, uh, nice volumes of milk, which were then bottle fed to the baby. And um, uh, again, this was it another shot of her at birth. Um, again, she, she hates these pictures of herself, but actually this experience was so powerful to her that she is now a board certified lactation consultant. Uh, we, we all come to this field for different reasons, but 
this prompted her to want to help other mothers. By the third day, uh, the baby was um, less tachypnic, breathing more comfortably and able to try to breastfeed. And uh, here I am trying to help, but uh, very little help. And this baby was still not great at breastfed feeding, but we kept spoon feeding this little baby. And there's the father spoon feeding them, uh, this little baby with the mother holding. And eventually everything turned out beautifully. But this is what I mean, trying to be nimble trying to think of, okay, CBA, and we'll eventually get this baby on by the time she goes home, whenever the production is good. But to make sure the baby's not losing too much, make sure the mother is producing enough. So this is just one little example, and you can think of thousands of other ways that this might be useful. So let's think about prenatal education. That would offer us an opportunity for focused education in the time frame right before uh, um, birth and right after delivery. If, if you do it too early, they're still kind of thinking of the color of the nursery and they're off someplace else. Uh, but if you do it right at the right moment, it's just like when, just like your video showed that when parents have new babies, they'll, is the best time to get them to wear seat belts and to stop smoking. But right, right before birth, in the last month, or even in labor and delivery, when they're sort of bored because they're just sitting there waiting for the baby, for their body to deliver this baby. Um, and then maybe even in the first hour. But if you teach them mother-centric, volume-centric information then, empowering messages, because you don't know, even though you come in with a birth plan, that's about the silliest thing in the world. Hardly any birth plan or baby plan or how I want to raise my kid plan comes out and works out exactly the way you want it. So if we could just normalize hand techniques um, to care for both the baby and the breast. I always say you have three babies. You have this baby right here and you have this breast and you have this breast. So how to care for baby and breast in the first hours. This is a lovely study um, and, uh, the, called the DAME study. So this is the DAME study. It was a multi-site study uh, focused on the safety of hand expression uh, after 36 weeks. And they did this on uh, mothers with gestational diabetes and asked them to use hand expression twice a day and collect what they had and bring it to the hospital to see if they could avoid uh, um, supplementation formula. And um, there was no increase in NICU admissions. There was no difference in gestational age at birth. So it didn't induce, a lot of people think, well, you might stimulate labor. Well. It did not stimulate labor if you practiced it from 36 weeks on. It increased exclusive breastfeeding during the first 24 hours. Uh, and basically it prevent the potential risk of precip precipitating delivery or infant harm in low risk women with diabetes was not detected. So a nice study to give us some support on this recommendation. If you think about it, <coughs> um, you would get the same contraction potential with love making and usually I don't hear obstetricians tell mothers that they're not allowed to have intercourse uh, or with tandem nursing with toddlers toddlers usually decide who are nursing when mothers become pregnant that the salt do you remember with pregnancy those little galactosite junctions open up the volume goes down the milk becomes salty and many of them say yuck this is not the sweet milk I wanted, nor is it the same volume. So they just quit. You, they naturally wean at that point. Some don't, some do. But anyway, so there doesn't seem to be, and a mother who's never had a preterm baby beginning at 36 weeks seems to be a safe <coughs> intervention. But again, you can always do this, you know, in labor and delivery. So antenatal expression familiar in the way I have been using it is just simply to familiarize a mother with the technique, not necessarily to collect it 
uh, because if you get really good at the technique, you could just do it right in the first hour. Let's see here. So let's talk about the pros and cons. Lots of mothers all practicing the same thing. Get the baby latched on, then just use your hands, hand express. You want to collect it, collect it. You want to need it to offer it to the baby, offer it to the baby. So let's think about what would be the arguments against doing something like this. Some people might say it's unnatural. Others might say that it causes the staff and the mother some discomfort handling breasts. Might be too demanding for the antenatal care providers. Or you could argue that it interferes with the first hour of focus on the baby. And you know that I can understand all of those positions, but let's also think about the pros. It would protect production if latch and milk transfer are or become suboptimal, because you're not quite sure what's gonna happen down the pike if the baby becomes too sleepy or whatever, or if the mother becomes too engorged and she can't latch on to the baby, can't latch on to the breast which is a common scenario. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. It's second, it's an easy time to learn uh, due to the hormones of labor. It's an easy time to express larger volumes of milk. It actually becomes a little more tricky on the second day. It builds skills to handle potential future problems such as engorgement or sore nipples. A very common scenario is uh, uh, the mother who goes home from the hospital, breastfeeding is going well, her milk comes in just that night she gets home and it, she gets so engorged that her nipple is more turgid and less stretchable and the baby can't get a deep latch and then the mother gets sore nipples and she, the flow isn't good and she's in pain and the baby's screaming and the father's crying and the whole thing is a mess. If you just know how to use your hands to soften your breast, get the milk flowing, and then put the baby on, bingo. It's just the solution. With the mother's consent, it's a potential way that partners can help. And as I mentioned before in our study of preterm mothers, it was a godsend for fathers to feel not like a third wheel, but somebody vital to the whole working of this uh, effort. It's also a natural lead in to as needed spoon feeding. The baby say loses 5% of birth weight. You just want to kind of put a little more frosting on the cake. Just, you know, every, after each feeding, just hand express, offer it. Um, the, uh, let me just throw in here a couple of, of my own biases. And I admit these are just my biases. Um, it, I would consider these potentially unsupportive practices, encouraging mothers to wash their hands every time they hand express and all this hand washing stuff. Now, I'm not talking about the day of COVID. I'm talking about once this whole thing is over with or before this began, thinking that somehow your hands are dirty or your breasts are dirty or whatever. But just, um, I wouldn't always get into what I would consider excessive hand washing because what I'm trying to do is not have any hurdles in the way of this mother who I want to hand express frequently simply to boost her production. I would not imply that every drop is li liquid gold and has to be collected. I mean, you know, in, or I would not suggest schedules that every two to three hours I want you to use your hands. What I would say is the more the better, wherever you are, uh, whatever you're doing, practice it in the shower and let it pour down the drain. Practice it when you're on the phone, when you're just talking to someone gabbing and, and just hand express. Practice when you're breastfeeding on the other side. Just get it out, get it out, get it out so your production uh, increases. Now, a lot of people might say, well, you don't want her to produce too much. 
But let me tell you that overproduction is a godsend problem compared to underproduction. You can gently bring, gradually decrease overproduction. Overproduction is like the savior for the rainy day if you get sick or something and your production goes down. If your breasts are programmed to produce more milk, you, you really, there's, the comeback is much easier. But the comeback for too little milk is, as we mentioned, really difficult. So those are just my personal bias. So how can we uh, um, make this easier for our staff? Because God forbid we should ask our staff to have to do a whole lot more uh, than they're already doing. And um, how can we teach expected mothers three uh, objectives before they go in, they, the baby is actually delivered? We need to understand what is a good latch. People always are talking about latch. <clears throat> Why is it important? What is a good latch? And if I don't get a good latch, how do I help my baby if needed? And how can I make more milk sooner? So those three things. So this is a little video. Um, the, what I've been at work on recently is uh, working on a website that is both in Spanish and English. And on it, we make videos for mothers in every scenario in those first uh, um, days. Uh, so whether you deliver a preterm baby or whatever, and this is a little video called breastfeeding in the first hour. It's in your hands and it's sort of designed for the mother who's uh, um, expected to have a fairly normal delivery by C-section or vaginal birth. Um, and uh, what I wanted them to know was to how to use their hands in the first hours when first milk matters most. And, and this is the abbreviated version. I think it's seven minutes. The full video is, um, uh, I think, about 11 minutes. So I cut some out. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the website. Everything is free. Every video is in Spanish and English. You can download it. You can use it any way you want. You can use it in your hospital education. And I'll talk to you about some other ways that many centers have been using it. So let's, let me see if I can make this work. When you're counting down the last days before delivery, learn how to make the first hours after delivery count. For breastfeeding to become a relaxing and fun part of your future, nursing needs to be comfortable for you and easy for your baby. And you need to make plenty of milk. This doesn't always happen automatically. But by understanding what to do in the first hours, you can get there. Instead of seeing how things go and not realizing this is the best time to prevent problems, know that breastfeeding can be in your hands when you understand three key points before delivery. What is a good latch? How can I help my baby if needed? And how can I make more milk sooner? When a baby is latched onto the breast well, the nipple is positioned and protected far back in the roof of his mouth. The reason that's important is because then the massaging action of his jaw and tongue is not on the nipple, but below the nipple. So he's massaging right here. This is how he can effectively get milk out of the breast. He's not latched on well, and the nipple is right by the lips. Then he doesn't get milk out of the breast, and it hurts, and it doesn't send a signal to the breast to make more milk unless he effectively gets milk out. After your baby is born, your obstetrician or your midwife will take your baby and place him skin to skin right on your breast to recover, maybe even before the cord is cut. And 
Babies normally take a period of time to recover from the delivery itself mm -hmm. and to wake up and explore and find your breast, scoot over to your breast, latch on, hopefully comfortably, mm -hmm. and learn how to nurse effectively. Okay. But if he doesn't, I don't want you to worry about that. If he doesn't learn how to nurse effectively in the first hour, you can take advantage of that first hour by making sure your production is protected by getting the milk out of your breast, even offering it to your baby. Mm -hmm. And you can also use your hands to help a baby learn how to latch onto the breast. So we'll start off with nipple to nose, always making sure that when he nurses, his head is tipped up. So his chin is pushing into the breast more than his nose. That way, the nipple goes straight to the top of his mouth instead of if we had him too high, that the nipple would point down towards his tongue. When he opens his mouth wide, he'll be able to latch on right down here so he can massage milk out. Look, all of a sudden we're kind of getting milk. If he was latched on too high up to your nipple, he wouldn't get anything. But if he's right down here, then he can get milk out of your breast. With his head tipped up, his chin pushes into the breast and your baby has long stretches of sucking and swallowing. With a bad latch, the baby's tongue and jaw will rub and hurt the nipple. Use your hands to help your baby get a good latch with the lower lip far below the base of the nipple. Try different positions to see what's most comfortable as breastfeeding should not be painful. In a football hold, tuck him far back at your side with your arm along his back, head tipped up, nipple to nose. Support your breast with fingers parallel to his lips. Rub his upper lip and wait for that gaping mouth before bringing him in, chin first. How can I make more milk sooner? The one thing we need to remember is that the first hour is super important as far as establishing a really robust milk production because this is the hour to signal your breast to make plenty of milk. So if your baby is on the breast, but you're not even sure if he's nursing very well, you can use your hands to get milk out of your breast. So let's learn how to do that. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna just push back towards your rib cage, and then you're gonna bring the, your finger and your pointer finger together, just like that, and then relax. So you can push back, and press, and relax. And what he'll start doing if you just give him just a drip is he'll start tasting it and with it, just like a kitty cat, he'll start licking it and swallowing it. Making plenty of milk doesn't happen automatically. The powerful and critical signal to your breast to make milk sooner is not being delivered in the first hour and then every two to three hours over the next several days. Do your baby whenever he appears ready way before he cries. He'll be less likely to get too little milk or to lose too much weight or to become too jaundiced. If he nursed very frequently and offered dessert from a spoon, first three days, you'll never overfeed first milk. You'll know when he's full. Days before your due date, practice the technique of hand expression. So now you really understand 
how important it is to use your hands. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> so now if you just go to first droplets with an S dot com, you will see six videos in English and Spanish free to download and uh, um, use in any way you'd like to um, help abbreviate the time that you and your staff need in explaining everything to your mothers and to um, give them the tools to hopefully um, <clears throat> protect their own breastfeeding experience. Because what if they don't get the help they need right away at two o'clock in the morning uh, when things are going awry? And there are also, and if you just let me know, I, uh, and just email me, uh, drjanemorton at gmail.com. I'm happy to send you, and these will soon be on the website, these QR codes and what a lot of centers are doing now is putting the QR codes for say the term baby and the hand expression video on the wristbands of either the mother or the baby in labor and delivery and asking them to watch it. Uh, but anything you'd like to do or on flyers, there's also on the uh, website uh, flyers for, to put in the office uh, for expectant mothers with these QR codes on it. Anything you can do to give more mothers uh, um, the, the tools to protect their own breastfeeding experience. That's the way I would phrase it. So can we change the perception? And this came from my daughter. Uh, when <clears throat> all, as you know, I've been a general pediatrician, but I have had a deep interest in breastfeeding for many decades. And when my daughter had her first baby, she came, she and her husband came to live with us um, uh, um, for several months. And my friends would say, Emma, you're going to breastfeed, aren't you? And she kept saying, I'm going to try. And I kept thinking, why does she keep saying I'm going to try when she knows I'm going to help her? So I asked her, I said, Emma, why do you keep saying you're going to try? Why don't you just say yes? you know if you have problems you got me and she got a little teary and i have to say a little pissy about it and let me know that the reason that she wanted to breastfeed was not because of me but it, she knew that it was what she wanted to do uh, for her baby but she also knew that many of her friends and colleagues had tried to breastfeed and had miserable experiences and she's one of those people who didn't set herself up for uh, um, for sadness, for a failed experience. So she just wanted to keep it on. I'm going to try. And I think that a lot of mothers come to the breastfeeding experience feeling that breastfeeding is very complicated. They've heard all these problems their friends have had. And that, that we've had, we've adopted this posture in maternity of wait for problems and then fix them rather than prevent them. And they, I think we, there's a sense that there are all these gadgets and the machines and everything else that are necessary, that it has sort of lost its sort of natural feeling, but uh, also that mothers come approach uh, the hospital uh, in labor and feel that the hospital routine and the hospital staff will protect my breastfeeding experience. And in some cases, that is the case. And in other cases, as we all know, that is definitely not the case. And so that I think what we need to do is shift our attention to not just earlier and trying to prevent problems, but more giving mothers more credit for their ability to uh, um, learn what, what, you, what we've just talked about is not very, not very complicated. It's pretty simple. And if we can convey this to mothers, <clears throat> just the, the, as Picasso did, the bare essentials, then, and, and everybody using the same language. So we're not talking about mastitis and, you know, return to work and everything else in the world, but just focusing on the launching pad of breastfeeding, getting it off to a good start. So, 
that's I want mothers instead to <clears throat> come to the hospital feeling I can do this. Anything I can do to help on the website or you have other creative ideas on how to use these videos, you just let me know. And um, now why don't we open this for discussion?